We have tried, it's been our ambition at least, to restore that whole sense of the glory days of the cries. And we hope and think that we've done it, um, that no longer is it just about, oh, those wonderful days gone by of the cries, but we think going forward, people are gonna say, wow, that cries building is such a glorious building. I think one of the best things about this building that it's very substantial, it's fireproof, um, soundproof, built like a brick house, and uh, as they say, and the architecture on on the exterior is just incredible. I mean, Lynchburg had some big time money back in those days, and they definitely spent some. The city of Lynchburg was founded by John Lynch, who was a Quaker, who had a ferry, very industrious, right? And being on the river, obviously a big benefit. And Lynchburg was known for tobacco. And at one point in time, in the 1800s, they were the third wealthiest city in the country. Two historical anomalies took place that really gave birth to the cries. The first one had nothing to do with the city of Lynchburg. It actually had to do with the city of Chicago. And it was the great fire of Chicago. 20,000 buildings were destroyed. An entire third of the worth of the city was wiped out in that fire. What does that have to do with Lynchburg? Well, um, the Chicago fire is what gave birth to a school of architecture that built high-rise skyscrapers. Scrapers. It's called the Chicago School of Architecture. So fast forward to Lynchburg. You know, Lynchburg in the early 1900s was truly one of the richest communities in the entire United States. A lot of money was here. And so money begets money. Industrious-minded people, you know, attract industrious-minded people. And so a gentleman by the name of Mr. Kreis decided that he was going to build in Lynchburg, Virginia, a skyscraper. Only seven stories tall at the time, but nevertheless, a skyscraper of its time. Chicago was kind of like an eye-opener and I'm sure you know Philip Cries was reading the newspaper you know and picked up on a lot of this. So you can see some of the old photographs where they've got the wood joist in here and they're tearing them out and then you can see photographs of them putting the uh, terracotta clay tile and concrete in place of it. So it's kind of fun to be able to go back into the building and actually see that and have a little bit of connection with 1904-1906 building. You know, the location of the cries with um, being right here on 9th and Main Street is significant because it is the very center of downtown commerce and government activity. And if we went back into the archives, we could see that um, the cries um, 9th and Main Street occupies the exact center of the charter that was originally given to Lynchburg as its township. Um, and so this, from the very get-go, has been the place to be in Lynchburg, dating all the way back to its original charter, which I think was like 1787. So when we talk about history, um, Ninth and Main and the Cries Building, um, we're not just blowing smoke here. You know, this is truly um, a place of the past. Obviously, any building downtown that is renovated makes for a much more attractive downtown. That's an iconic building. You know, it's right in the very heart of downtown. You know, we think to be a part of the cries is to be a part of the history of Lynchburg, which has not been altogether lovely. You know, um, we have had our heyday, and, um, and we, like most other cities in the country, um, fell by the wayside, um, as did the Cries Building. You know, the last 20, 25 years for the Cries Building has been a rather depressing time. Um, it's been idle, um, and the people who tried to renovate it and put it back into service um, were not able to do so. Probably one of the, the difficult parts in design was we were working with the Department of Historic Resources, which is the state uh, agency for historic tax credits, and the Department of Interior National Park Service, because this was a federal and state historic tax credit project. Drivers of that were state and federal tax credits. When that became available, that would allow a developer to come in 
and transition these buildings, repurpose them as it were, but repurpose them and have some assistance in being able to do that. Those two programs are what I have seen really, really drive the ability of developers to come in and repurpose the buildings. They have a lot to say about what you do, of course. And so the corridors were the Achilles heel. Um, we had to maintain the existing corridors that were still intact because this was an office building up on the upper floors, a bank down on the first floor. And so we had to work with the historic material that was still left here. Now on some floors, they had taken out the corridors, but you could see the footprint of it in the floor where the walls used to lay. And so uh, Department of Historic Resources, we went down a couple of times to talk to them to try to work it out. The Cries Building has been very important to um, City Council. They have, there's been several issues that have come up and the owners have come to City Council and they have wanted to see that building, you know, redeveloped. Sometimes it's hard to force a, a you know, a square peg through a round hole and that's the way this kind of developed, was taking the bum wad, laying it down, and trying to work those spaces out to where you could get the most uh, usable space uh, that you could without structurally cutting the building all to pieces. It's a um, stately building um, that adorns the Lynchburg skyline. Um, but, you know, when we looked at this building, and we've been looking at it a long time, um, we decided early on that there's some things that um, just cannot be replicated, and you could not build the Cries building today. It would be prohibitively expensive. This building was done by a great architect, and it had great bones. It had uh, great proportions to it. Uh, they designed it with a base, a shaft, and a capital, just like a classical building the capital being the seventh floor for the most part, uh, the shaft being from, uh, I guess, about second floor to fifth, sixth floor. And so, um, you know, you, you want a heavy base, you want it to look like it's holding this thing up, so you've got a massive heavy base at the bottom, then you've got something that's a little bit lighter in between that's not as ornate, and then you get to the top and boom, that's when you get the, the capital, you get all the mullions and, uh, incredible windows up on the seventh floor with a lot of divided lights which is, is muttons that divide the, the lights the, the glass up. We're proud to say that the Cries today is a national green building standard um, apartment complex building. Um, we went to great details to make it energy efficient um, and as safe and resourceful as a building could possibly be. It's a great building, uh, it just uh, the natural light is awesome, big windows, but that also leads into energy. And with large windows, obviously a lot of energy goes out an old window. But in our design, and, and what we found out with doing a lot of historic buildings, is that you don't have to remove the historic window to have an energy efficient window. You can put an energy panel on the interior side and seal it up to where um, air doesn't move through it and it performs just as well as a modern window, you know, the double pane insulated glass. Um, after a lot of work and, um, and a lot of money, uh, we've been able to put the cries back together again. And it's interesting, um, very few buildings can tell the story of the community like the Cries building can. You know, from its heyday, um, at the, the time it was built in 1905, um, throughout the years of languishing, which the Cries did, um, just like anything else did in Lynchburg, to once again, um, finding itself restored in this time of renaissance that downtown Lynchburg is experiencing right now. And the cries is telling that story. Anytime you can get a building repurposed, right? And it, you want to do that. And repurposed in a way that, you know, either increases it on the tax rolls or provides another amenity or service. So downtown is really a story of 
really hard work for a very long time. So what makes the Cries building so special? First of all, the architecture, you know? Um, and from there, you have to say the location. Uh, the location, I mean, you were within blocks of one of the nicest theaters in all of the Eastern Seaboard and the Academy of Music recently restored. You have award-winning um, natural trails and bike parks, you know, right three blocks from here, the James River's three blocks from here. You're in the middle of all the shopping district. You know, we like to say that the Cries is built um, and exists at a pedestrian scale where you literally can be emancipated from your automobile for a few days or a few weeks and not miss it at all. The location for me was great because it was in downtown. It was in um, near the running trails, it's near the shops. It's a mile from the train station. It's eight minutes from my parents, eight minutes from the hospital. And so it's a great location. Everyone's just been so accommodating and if you're looking for kindness and you want to be in the heart of activities, I mean, this is, this is the place to be. We have a saying around here, um, and it is this, that we want to spoil you. Um, we say, why not experience New York style architecture with a little bit of Southern hospitality? Beyond the basics of just valet and grocery delivery, when you pull up, if you've got groceries, We'll take them up to the room uh, so that you can get out of the, the weather. We'll park your car. We'll bring everything up to you. Beyond that, we have a storage area where you can keep a bicycle, golf clubs. We even have canoes down there. And you just give me a call. Let me know. I'll go downstairs. I'll grab the items. I'll bring them up here for you, load them in the vehicle, and off you go. Christ is luxury and a feeling of security. So it's the ideal home that you can ever think of. And I'm living in that home, so that's so special. And I wanted something really quiet and secure and safe. And when I saw this for the first time, it just spoke to me. The Christ for me is, is wonderful. The building, the unit is wonderful, it's spacious, more than I expected. And the people are absolutely wonderful mm -hmm. thus far. Mm -hmm, they are. I mean, it, it, they're our neighbors, and the people that we met, they're all professional, they're kind, um, and it's just a nice place. I mean, when I go out for my run, I come back in. It's just a nice place to be. That the cries was never intended just to be a functional or utilitarian building. It's functional, to be sure. Um, you know, it's got a basement that can hold storage. It's got lovely commercial space on the first floor. It's got a very um, attractive lobby. You know, um, it's got first and I mean one bedroom and two bedroom and three bedroom units. And you know, the seventh floor um, offers and features some of the most impressive penthouses anywhere in central Virginia. But, but functionality was never the goal of the Cries building. You know, the Cries building really was more about um, a work of art. I mean, literally a piece of art. Um, so much so and so beautiful was the Cries during its day that um, a poet, um, Duval Porter, um, literally wrote a poem about the Cries building, submitted it to the Richmond Times Dispatch, which at that time was, the, it still is, the largest, most circulated newspaper in the state of Virginia. And in that poem, um, Duval Porter said this about the Cries. A thing of beauty, strength and grace, an honor and an ornament, to Cries and to his native place, whose very worth and sentiment outweighs the money on it spent. His monument in coming years, a city's pride and epitaph, when he who built it disappears, the structure speaks in his behalf. And like Augustus, he may say, Lynchburg's marble and not clay.